I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, neurotropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I am your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you episode number 35 of this podcast dedicated to the improvement of your brain by any and all means at your disposal. Today's episode is one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. This is a theme that, um, sort of like a a meta theme in science, just one of those things you need to kind of continually go back and remind yourself and wonder about the statistics that you hear bandied about, if they should really be taken at face value sometimes. This is also just a, a great topic to think about every time you're reading the news newspaper and a couple of ideas are put together and you're like, wait a minute, do those ideas really belong to be together? We're going to be talking about the principles of correlation and causality and the differences between those two. And with time zones and such, it's taken a while to schedule this phone call, but we're going to the far reaches of Norway to talk with a bona fide expert on this subject for the main meat of the episode. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I've got kind of a follow-up to something that we talked about a few weeks earlier. This is, once again, deals with the idea of memory zapping and some ideas that neuroscientists are coming up with now to zap undesirable memories out of people's brains. Uh, I just think this is a really, really interesting and like kind of a weird sci-fi-ish, potentially dystopian topic. So anyway, it's just something I, I keep reading about and wanted to bring to your attention. We're also going to be giving away three more bottles of the L-theanine and caffeine pills, Green Tea Focus. Uh, this is, I think, our third and final week of doing that, and I will be announcing the winners from the previous week. But before we get into any of that, let's do This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts. This week in neuroscience. So there was an interesting article in CNN.com this past week on how your brain makes moral judgments based on some research done at Duke University. And researchers have known for some time that there are some specific spots within the brain that seem to be tied with or evaluating the morality of different actions, not just should they be done, are they good ideas, but are they right or are they wrong? You know, if you're in a sinking lifeboat and you need to throw a couple people over the side to save the rest to keep the lifeboat from sinking. How many people are worth sacrificing? All those sorts of doozy situations where there's there's a moral, ethical component to the decision you're making. So among the interesting things that they talked about in this article is how, as you might expect, there are notable differences that they can see within the brains of psychopaths. And not surprisingly, in the psychopaths, there were some some distinct differences in brain activity, blood flow, things like that. Underwhelming performance from some of these moral, ethical centers. Psychopaths tended to show less activation in the medial, frontal, and posterior cingulate cortices in response to moral dilemmas. These results suggest, said the scientists, that in criminal psychopaths, the brain does not adequately use emotional information to control behavioral responses. Another really interesting study they mentioned was one involving TMS, which we talked about before on this show, a transcranial magnetic stimulation, where basically you can use magnets to amplify or, or de-amplify the activity of certain brain regions. And as you might expect, this technology can be used on these sort of morality-affecting regions of the brain as well. And by by intentionally mucking about with these moral centers, they were able to get participants in the study to think that it was more permissible to attempt to inflict harm on other people, and for instance, a failed murder attempt, than they would otherwise be. So obviously, this conjures all sorts of weird, like, what if bad people got into your brain with transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and, and turned off your morality and turned us all into a bunch of savages? Or it sounds like it could be a good plot for a sci-fi movie where some sort of high-tech helmet turns off everybody's moral centers. But the, the the interesting thing with the application of this technology is that the opposite might actually be true. There, there might be the possibility of, of boosting the moral centers in people that, for one reason or another, maybe are, are a little bit underdeveloped in these areas. Of course, that brings into question who's the, who's going to be the person that is the arbiter of, well, would you have a well-functioning moral center or not? That in itself is a you know slippery slope for society, but one way or another, that's a, something that society is going to be having to grapple with in the near future. And, and so it's interesting that studies like this are taking place. We will, of course, put the link to this article up on the smartdrugsmarts.com website. Smart Drug Smarts. Yeah, I also want to give credit retroactively to Steve for kicking us the article last week on sleep deprivation and brain damage. That was an article that was sent in by a listener. thought that was really interesting and definitely wanted to encourage other listeners if you guys read something that you think might be a worthy installment in the This Week in Neuroscience. Heck, it's very possible that you'll find it before I do. Definitely feel free to toss articles my direction using the website. We got a contact page and my ultra secret email is jesse at smartdrugsmarts.com. So yeah, lots of ways to get in touch and definitely appreciate any neuroscience 
neuroscience-y stuff that you want to kick this direction. And also, Ben, the show's producer, wanted me to give a secondary This Week in Neuroscience this week, mentioning that phase one of the largest neuroscience research hospital in the U.S. was completed this week. We'll have an article about that pinned on the post for this podcast episode. Also, this is in, I think, like Bethesda, Maryland, or somewhere around the U.S. capital area. But the pictures make this uh, building look pretty swank. As you might imagine, with all the neuroscience stuff going on nowadays and with all the public sector funding going into brain research. Also wanted to announce by name, in fact, or at least by name and initial, the three winners from last week in our Green Tea Focus giveaway. That was Joe L, Sajmir S, and Felipe M. And so all three of these people will be getting a bottle of green tea focus caffeine plus L-theanine pills shipped out to them sometime in the next week or so here. We had three other winners the week before, which I I don't have their names in front of me, so that'll probably be lost in the mist of history. And we're going to be doing one more. This is our final week where we're going to be giving away three bottles of this stuff. So if you are interested in that, be sure to sign up with your email address on smartdrugsmarts.com for the Smart Drug Smarts mailing list, and you'll be in the running for our final three bottles. I personally find myself popping probably... say two days a week, I'm probably taking a caffeine plus L-theanine pill, and I would say it is well worth trying to get your own free bottle. Smart Drug Smarts. And in less national news, happy to report that picked up another five-star review on iTunes from a long-term come down who says, lots of the episodes have such great info that I have to listen to them several times to digest all the information. I listened to each of them a couple times myself, which has mostly to do with the editing process, and I couldn't avoid it even if I wanted to, but thank you so much. So we're going to jump into the main interview now, and this is with Dr. Rani Lil Anjum from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And Dr. Anjum approaches the idea of causation and correlation, both from a scientific and also a philosophical perspective. Both scientists and philosophers sort of have a vested stake in this question around causality. But I guess, first of all, just to make sure that everybody's kind of at the, at the same starting point for this conversation. So the, the classic one that people always talk about in describing the difference between causation and correlation is ice cream consumption and death by shark attacks. It turns out that there's a strong positive correlation between having like recently eaten ice cream and being killed in a shark attack. Every time you see the amount of ice cream being eaten by your average person go up, you also see a likely incident that your average person is going to be eaten in a shark attack, which might lead you to naively think that sharks like eating people with ice cream in their belly or something like that, that the ice cream is somehow at fault and directly causing the shark attack. But of course, we all know that's ridiculous, and there's, there's got to be something else going on, which in this case would be hot summer weather, which leads to increased ice cream sales, increased swimming in the ocean, and thus increased shark attacks. So there's sort of a third relationship related factor going on here. So that would be an example of a correlation that does not have a direct causal connection. But okay, with that as preamble, let's dive into the interview. So usually we think that correlations can be accidental or causal. So there are all these kinds of correlations that they would learn about in statistics courses that the ice cream sales seem to be correlated with drowning accidents and shark attacks, right? but it might be too far-fetched to say that the, the ice cream sales is causing shark attacks or causing uh, drowning accidents. So here we think that it's not really a causal relationship as such, but maybe there is a kind of common cause to these correlations, such as warm summer weather. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay, so that's correlation. Um, other, uh, when it comes to causation, it's more difficult because people are not always clear on what causation is. But it seems that causation should be something that ties the correlations together. So there should be something about the cause that produces the effect. But in what way does so is a philosophical question. And here are the big controversies. If you're trying to prove scientifically that, you know, X causes Y, you know, at at the very least, I guess the the smallest burden of proof that you should have would be that every time X happens, Y necessarily follows from it. Like, at, at the very least, you need to make it over that hump, right? Exactly. That seems to be the basic assumption that if you have causation, at least you should have correlations. Right. So a lot of philosophers thinks that, think that correlation is causation plus, no, A number of philosophers think that causation is correlation plus something more. For instance, some kind of necessary connection between them. Right. And this idea seems to go back to David Hume uh, in uh, 1700, and where he said that causation 
is about the cause being constantly conjoined with the effect. And he used the billiard balls as his example, and he said this is the perfect instance of causation when you see how the billiard balls behave on the billiard ball table. So he said you can see two billiard balls, and you can hit one, and you see it rolling, and then you see a collision, and then the other ball continues to roll. And he says, every time you do this, you will see the same. First, the one ball rolling, event A, then the collision, and then the event B. So from here, he said that actually, we don't need anything more than this because we cannot actually observe anything else. So the only thing we can deal with when we're dealing with causation is correlations. So causation for, for Hume was nothing more than correlations. And a number of philosophers agree with this view. So if that's the case, though, I mean, it's probably true that every single time it gets warmer, that the number of shark attacks goes up. So, I mean, you would you would still have correlation in that case every single exactly. time. Exactly. This is the problem. So how do you how do you distinguish between accidental and causal correlations then? Yeah. Uh, so what people do when they um, when they argue for this kind of view is that they say, look, it might not be that simple a story, there could be things interfering, but if we analyze it all the way down and we include everything that we need to get the effect, then we will find correlations. And I think this is, this is commonly accepted by scientists as well, because when we look at correlation data, what do we actually see? We don't seem to find anything that is a cause perfectly correlated with the effect. There seems to be all sorts of interventions and interference of the effect. So we know, for instance, that smoking causes cancer, but surely not everyone who smokes actually get cancer. Right, right. Actually, more people don't get cancer than the people who get cancer. So how can we say that we have demonstrated from correlations that we have uh, a causal relationship between smoking and cancer. And if you think of the birth control pill, contraception pill, it is proven to cause uh, thrombosis. But if you look at how many people actually get thrombosis when they use the birth control pill, I think it's one in a thousand. So it seems like you have to treat 999 cases as contraexamples that should have <laughs> falsified the hypothesis, but we don't do that. So what, what are we really saying? Are we saying that the 999 cases, there is something that is interfering and that under ideal conditions, they should all get thrombosis? You know, because yeah. that seems to be the effect of saying that at least you need correlations. So when we look at the statistical data, we seem to look for these kind of, if there is a slight correlation, if there is a bit more of the effect when you have the cause than when you don't have the cause. We seem to think this is enough and that everything else is treated as some kind of noise mm -hmm. or just interference data. So it, it seems that even when we say that, well, look, this is noise, we expect that if we had known more, we would have found kind of perfect correlation. So, so let's think of the smoking case. So smoking causes cancer, but not everyone gets cancer from the smoking. But maybe if we studied the group of people who actually get cancer from smoking, maybe we find some kind of similarities that would enable us to put them in the same kind of subgroup. And if we only tested for people within that same kind of subgroup, so people who smoke 20 cigarettes a day, don't exercise so much, don't eat that healthy, don't, uh, you know, we could say that maybe then we would get like a 100% correlation. Right, right. And then we might test it, and we probably don't find 100% correlation. And then we could think, well, but let's just narrow it down even further. You know, so if we include more and more factors so that we can narrow the subgroup further and further, eventually we should come to something that looks like a perfect correlation so that whenever you had the cause, you would have the effect. But and, and I guess in that case, it would be the cause could be broken down into like a variety of parameters. You could, you know, you mentioned you know, several different things there that might cause the 
or th that might lead to the 100% causal certainty there in, in your cigarette example, if it was, you know, cigarettes plus bad diet plus several other things. Um, yeah. so, so I guess a variety of inputs could be necessary to still give you your, um, you know, sort of causal certitude. Yeah, so the idea is that eventually you will get something that would make the cause sufficient for the effect, so that whenever you had all these causal factors, you would get the effect. The problem is, of course, that let's say you did this empirically, so you, you continued including more and more, and then eventually you had a very, very small group of people that had all these factors. And if you tested it on them, they might not all get cancer. So what do you do? Eventually, you're down to a subgroup that has only one member. And then how do you prove correlation <laughs> right. from that? So then you would have to say, look, if you had an identical twin, if we had that identical twin doing exactly the same as you, they should get exactly the same effect as you do. But why? what's the, what's the rationale for saying that? Why, why do we think that is true? It seems that the idea that causation is correlation with or without something more is a kind of theoretical assumption. It's not something that is actually empirically proven. Yeah. It, you know, it almost seems, as we talk about it, that, that maybe this is something that shouldn't be two separate words. Maybe we should throw out the word causation and, and just accept that correlation might be on a, a sliding scale somewhere between, you know, 0% and 100% and think of it as a as a spectrum rather than a, an absolute. Yes, actually, this is uh, this is very common idea. So uh, I was just at the philosophy conference and someone said to me, look, scientists, they don't care about this perfect correlation in the sense that David Hume was talking about. All they care about is correlation in the sense of probability racing. So the cause somehow raises the probability of the effect. Okay, so all they do, they look at the statistical data, they see if there's a slightly, slightly bigger chance of having the effect if you have the cause than without the cause. Okay, so let's say that you then, let's say you test a drug, a new drug for the market, and you see that, well, actually, four out of ten people, uh, they get they get better with this drug. Okay, so mm -hmm. then the doctor is supposed to use this because now evidence-based medicine is of course very important. So you should use the evidence in your clinical decisions in individual cases. So you have your patient there. You look at this drug, it's absolutely the best drug on the market given the statistics. So you say, look, I give this drug to you and it's 40% chance that you will recover. Okay, what does this mean? It depends not only on what you think about causation, but it also depends on how you think about probability. Because it might be that you think that, actually, if I had known more about this, you know, this study, then I should have been able to specify the subgroup so much that 100% of these people got it. So at this stage, I'm not really sure. All I know is that it's 40% chance that I am right if I predict that you will be better you mm -hmm. will recover from this drug. So then the probability racing is all about racing the probability of my knowledge. So we call that credence. It's the credence you have in the outcome. So you don't want to predict with 100% certainty. That would be stupid. So instead you just say, I predict with 40% certainty. But that's not really probabilistic causation. So what you could do instead is you could say, look, this is actual probability racing. The drug raises the probability in each and every one of these 10 people, but it does so with 0.4 probability. Mm -hmm. So then you would say that each and every one of these people, they had the same probability racing uh, from the drug. And then we don't know exactly why four of them got better and six of them didn't get better. But you will interpret the probability as the statistical average from the group that you have tested. It's interesting when you think about you know, what you just said in the context of economics and pharmaceutical manufacturers, because honestly, they would probably rather have a drug that you know, made you 40% better to get likely and not know exactly what the specific causal chain is so they could sell it to two and a half times more people than if they knew how to get that to 100% certainty. But meanwhile, they're cutting out you know, uh, two thirds, I guess, of their potential buyers. That is, that is amazing. I have never thought of it that way because I thought, well, being a scientist and all, you know, not me, but them, I would think that they were off the 100% success rate. But of course, uh, <laughs> yeah. if you think of who's going to benefit from this, then it's actually better to say, 
mm, it's only one in a thousand that get better, but we sell it to all of you just in case. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, they're, they're probably looking for sort of that sweet spot where people think, well, shucks, if it's, a, if it's got a 25% chance of curing my cancer, then, then heck, I'll buy it because it's really important. Yeah. Okay, but you see the problem here with with uh, with uh, using the statistical average. Yeah. Because once you're sitting in front of a person, how do you know that they represent a statistical average person? I mean, how do you know that this drug is going to work with 0.4 probability in them? I mean, surely if it turns out that this person is a kind of they might have some allergies, they might be vegetarian, they might be have some other diseases. There might be all sorts of things that could affect the way the the, the drug will, will work and interact with their body. Yeah. So how come that we think the statistical average is exactly the probability we can assign in this case? I mean, very often the statistical average doesn't even exist. Well, in, sure. In no yeah. way we... Fifty yeah, percent. Your, your average person has has one breast and one testicle, and, and we all know that doesn't represent very many people. Exactly, and in Norway, uh, the average woman used to have one point eight kids. But I mean, even if your kid doesn't have an arm or something, you still can't call it one point eight kids. It's still two kids. So exactly. I mean, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't really work like that. And also a problem with that. Uh, with that, uh, it's called frequentism. The frequentist view on uh, probability is that the, the the probability in an individual case is given by a frequency of trials. But when you do a trial, let's see you do some randomized control trials, you can do different studies and they will give you different results. Does that mean that the probability changes? from one study to the other, or does it mean that you have to test more people to get closer to the truth? Because usually what we say in frequentism is that the higher the number of trials, the closer you get to the real probability. But what is this real probability if it's, if it's just given, it's generated by statistics? Mm -hmm. Why think you need more? Because that seems to assume that the real probability is actually something beyond the statistics beyond the frequentism. So the alternative is propensity theory. And propensity theory is the idea that having certain properties will give you a propensity and thereby a probability of a certain outcome. So let's say that you have this drug and then you use another drug in addition, that might change your propensities. That might mean that these drugs work against each other instead of with each other. So there are some drugs, for instance, that are designed to lower blood pressure, clonidine and some beta blockers. Mm -hmm. But if you take them together, they actually tend towards raising uh, blood pressure. So it's not, it's not clear that you can just say, look, we give, you this, we give you this medication and you should have the same effect no matter what else you're doing. We're always thinking that yeah, we want to know what other drugs you're taking. We want to know a bit more before we assign this treatment to you. Yeah. The problem if you only use statistics is that you have to assume you're in front of some kind of statistical average person. What are some of the most common logical pitfalls that people should watch out for? Well, for instance, we read in the newspapers all the time a lot of correlation data, like uh, married men live longer, uh, people are happier without kids. Um, we we tend to we tend to interpret these as causal claims. So, for instance, let's say that I want to be happy. Should I then not have kids? Um, will that cause me to become happy, or uh, maybe I would become less happy from it? Uh, and the same with married men live longer. If we if we think that the marital contract as such is going to make you live longer than signing the contract. You might assume that this is going to solve your problems and give you a long life. So the question here is, if there is a causal relationship, the theory should say something about it. And well, if we look at the married men live longer, it seems that the contract as such shouldn't be thought of as the cause. There should be some other factors that might be common for marriage. Sure. 
the type of person who gets married tends to be the type of person who's long lived for some, you know, related but but not exactly the same reason. Yeah, for instance, so if you look at some uh, studies done on this particular topic, there are a number of examples where people try to to uh, explain how the marriage is making men live longer and not women, for instance. And some of the factors are that you die earlier if you're lonely, isolated, if you have bad eating habits, uh, things like that. And then those are the causes. I mean, it's not the it's not the marriage as such that should count as the causes of a long life. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so so I think this is because we don't often use the actual word cause. We we talk about causation like around causation. We talk about influence production, interference, prevention, but all of these are causal verbs, you know? Yeah, it, it's almost as if humans have a, a real emotional need to try to, you know, create a causal chain, whether we have enough information to really do so or not. I mean, everything from, you know, like people in ancient times, you know, seeing a flash of lightning and deciding that it was a god throwing a thunderbolt and stuff like that. Like, why, why do you think humans have that deep-seated need to know the reason for everything? Huh? Oh, I think it's a very deep-rooted urge in humans to understand their surroundings. It's also about, uh, you know, if we want to interact with the world and we see that we are costly affected by our surroundings, we need some kind of control, you know. So when we see that, oh, this seems to happen every time I do this, well, Maybe this means that if I do this in the future, I will get the same result. Yeah. And it kind of gives us, uh, I mean, technology, think of technology. Is, it's essential for technology that we understand how things work. But the question is, do we really learn about these causal relations from observing correlations? Because I think not. It seems to me that if all we could observe were pure correlations, we would never learn anything causal. So I like this example of um, we know that um, pressing the light switch turns the lamp on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so of course I can try to confirm this causal hypothesis by pressing the light switch over and over and over and see the lamp comes on over and over and over. I can do it like a thousand times, think maybe that's not representative, so I do it like 200,000 times. You know, but what have I really learned? It seems to me I learn much more about that causal connections when the lamp doesn't come on. And then I have to investigate what's going on here. Yeah. And I might discover like, oh, this lamp bulb looks a bit black, you know, and it has this weird sound when I shake it. Oh, no, I forgot to plug in the socket. Or no, this, this wire seems to be chewed up by a rat. You know, so you, you learn these you learn that these these things are somehow causally relevant for linking the cause to the effect. And of course, if there's a sort of short circuit, you you know no none of the electric um, machines are going to work at all. So it's it seems to me that it's when causation seemingly breaks down when you have the cause but you don't have the effect. That's when you really learn. Yeah, absolutely. How, what's the connection here? And I think that has been ignored too much because a lot of the scientific um, methods today is about constantly and repeatedly uh, affirming your hypothesis. Look at, look at people saying that, look, we need more data. If only we had more data, we would figure it out. It seems like we think that if we knew all the facts in the world, we would also be able to derive all the causal relations between them. But why do we think that? Why do we think that every fact gives you for free the causal relations? It seems that if you want to understand causal relations, you have to interact with the world. You have to, you have to actually try to change things and interfere and put things in different contexts. Because it seems like causation is essentially context dependent. Pure correlations are not. Okay, so let's say you have something that is constantly conjoined. For instance, water is H2O. Mm -hmm. It's not context sensitive at all. It cannot be interfered with. It's not that sometimes when you have water, it's H2O and sometimes not. Uh, it's always, they always come together because it's identity. 
it's the same thing. And you can say whales are mammals, and every time you have a whale, you have a mammal, you don't need more data. You don't have to check, you don't have to isolate the cause, and uh, you don't need any statistics for it because it's a kind of classification. Yeah, it's like definitional. Statement. Yeah, it's definitional. So uh, we have one, one case that uh, uh, we often end up discussing in philosophy conferences uh, when I mention it, which is the Down syndrome and the extra chromosome. Because we might think that the Down syndrome is caused by the extra chromosome, and then it seems like you have a case of perfect correlation. Whenever you have the extra chromosome, you have Down syndrome. But it seems to me that maybe this is actually a case of identity, where we define the Down syndrome in terms of the extra chromosome. So it's the test of the Down syndrome. So you can have the symptoms to a higher or, or lower degree, but if you have the extra chromosome, that is the definition. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, so, so causation on, uh, on, uh, on my view is a tendency. So causes will tend towards their effect and they can do so in a weaker or a stronger way. So you could say that the birth control pill has a weak tendency towards thrombosis and that smoking has a stronger tendency towards, towards cancer. The typical for these tendencies is that they can be contracted by other tendencies. So let's say that you smoke, but you also drink all these green juices every day. That is going to contract the cancer. You, mm-hmm. know? you might also have very good genetic setup, might be no cancer in your family whatsoever, maybe exercise, maybe you live in the countryside. All of these things will contribute and they will, they will contract the cancer. But that doesn't guarantee anything because all of these tendencies, they don't guarantee any particular outcome but still they would explain how sometimes you would reach a certain threshold where the effect occurs. Got it. Yeah. Is that too complicated? No, no, no. (laughs) You know what, talking about uh, sort of the philosophical version of the causation conversation reminds me of is, you know, it, it seems like every kid when they're about three years old, they suddenly realize that an adult tells them something and they can ask why. And then regardless of what the adult's response is, they can ask why again. And, and yeah. like for a day, they just go around asking why to everything and annoying the hell out of all the adults around them. And, and it kind of seems like that's the, the super childish version of the whole you know, causation question. It's like, have we, philosophically, have humans been making any progress on this issue in the past 2000 years? Of course, we all think we have solved the problem, but we actually did solve the problem. (laughs) So there are, there are different theories of causation. One is that causation is only correlations. Okay, so that is called humanism, or you could call it humanism after David Hume. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there are many sophisticated versions of this. David Lewis uh, is uh, one of the most famous uh, neo humans um, A very related theory is that causes is something that makes a difference to the effect. And that's a very common understanding. I mean, randomized controlled trials, it's all premised on difference making account of causation. So when you have to groups, you have one maybe placebo or control group, and then you have one test group, and causation is all in whether you can find a difference. Can you find a difference between these two groups? Yeah. So it's a, it's a very strong, it's a very strong uh, theory, both in philosophy and in science. Well, thank you very, very much to Dr. Anjum for that mind-bending interview. And yeah, I think causality is one of those things that's really interesting to think about. And although maybe not as directly relevant to smart drugs and nootropics and brain stuff as some of the interviews that we've done, I think thinking about those sort of big picture mental framework type questions can certainly really inform the sort of smaller tactical decisions of should I be taking this pill or that, that kind of thing. And now the Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts. Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. So advance warning that I'm going to probably butcher some names here, but this is a study that's coming out of Rabud University Niemingen in the Netherlands, and a neuroscientist named Maureen Kroos was the lead on this study, showing that electroconvulsive therapy, which is also called electric shock therapy, and yes, is sort of the thing that makes you think back to the 1950s with people being shocked for all manner of psychiatric disorders. Although this is done a bit differently now when they when they use electroconvulsive therapy on people, it does not actually make them convulse because they use muscle relaxants and stuff like that. 
like that. But anyway, without his preamble, electric shock therapy has been used to apparently disrupt the formation of memories, which maybe shouldn't surprise you, but what is interesting is it's disrupting the formation of selected memories based on having those memories having been recently recalled by people. So they did this study where they showed depressed patients two disturbing images. Then in a session talking with a doctor, the person had to recall, bring back into mind one of those two images and answer some questions about it, blah, blah, blah. So it was sort of fresh in their mind. Then the patient received electroconvulsive therapy. And then a day later they were tested and it turned out that the two memories, which should have been approximately equal based on, you know, the importance of the memory to the person and how long ago the memory had been initially formed and all that stuff. And maybe you would think that the thing that they'd talked about with the researcher, they would have a better memory of because it had been called back to mind fairly shortly after. But just the opposite was true. Basically, the memory that had been freshly reawakened by the therapeutic session just prior to the electric shock therapy was much worse. Like basically the, the memory got almost completely zapped out of existence, whereas the one that hadn't been recalled recently was maintained as a normal memory. So essentially what they think is going on here is that each time a memory is sort of brought back into consciousness, something that you're actively thinking about, it becomes a little wobbly. It becomes susceptible to change, or in this case, apparently deletion. And whereas normally a memory would sort of get saved back into long-term storage, for lack of a better analogy, it seems like there definitely is a time-based window of opportunity after a memory has been recently thought about, where it really can have its reinsertion into the long-term storage disrupted. So needless to say, electroshock therapy is probably not something they're going to be selling on every street corner to get rid of undesirable memories anytime soon, but this is pretty promising technology and, uh, yeah, strangely reminiscent of that film Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind from several years ago. <laughs> Okay, that is the episode. When I say that is the episode, that is strongly correlated with the actual end of the episode, and this time it is no exception. If you liked what you heard, please recommend this podcast to your friends and or leave us a review on iTunes. Show notes for this episode, as with all episodes, will be online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com, including links to everything that we talked about here. I will be back at you next week, once again, with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smart Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.